And welcome to Redesigning a Developer Portal. Can you hear me okay? Well, welcome to Redesigning a Developer Portal that your developers will actually want to use. Uh, I'm Karen White. I work with our, um, I'm a developer advocate at a company called BigCommerce. Um, so I work with our developer ecosystem uh, representing their interests to our product and our documentation teams. Um, and I also work on projects that uh, boost engagement with our developer community. So things like writing content for our developer blog. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking to you about a project that we've been working on over the last year, which is taking our developer portal from something that used to be pretty uninspired um, to something that now our company is really proud of and our developers actually love to use. So this is really a story of our developer portal kind of evolving in parallel with the way that we think about developer experience as a company. Um, so in order to understand why we undertook this project in the first place, um, you kind of have to understand a little bit about who we are as a company. So we are a SaaS e-commerce platform. Um, think websites with a shopping cart. But when you think of SaaS, you might think of this. The black box. Um, so unlike an on-premise solution, because we're SaaS, our core application and our services are running in the cloud. So as a developer, you can't actually go in and look at the code that's powering the core platform. So that can feel limiting to some developers who are used to being able to solve problems and answer questions by going in and looking at source code directly. <coughs> so what we are moving towards is a way to leverage all of the things that are actually pretty awesome about SaaS, like worry-free infrastructure and updates, um, but also let some light into that black box. And the way that we're doing that is by opening APIs for all of the core components of our platform. Um, so when our product team builds out a new feature, part of their checklist for making sure that that feature is complete is also building out a public API that supports that feature. Um, so the product is actually not considered complete until there's an API that goes along with it. Um, or conversely, what we're doing more and more is actually building that public API first and making it available to the developer community. And then we build the official feature on top of that same API. Um, so that brings us to kind of where we are today, um, where we have this goal of being the world's most open SaaS platform. So what does that really mean to be open when you're SaaS? Um, for us, it means that API-first mindset, or at least the not complete until there's an API mindset. Um, but it also means that as a developer, you should be able to decouple parts of the platform. So if you want to um, just use the catalog functionality or just the cart and checkout, that is something that you should be able to do. Um, or if you want to build a completely headless architecture and use big commerce to power the back end, and some other framework as your front end presentation layer, um, that's something that you should be able to do as well. So that kind of flexibility is really important to where we want to go as a company. Um, but developers are really key to that success, right? Because developers are the ones who are actually going to be extending your platform and building those things. So in order to be successful, you have to give developers a place where they can go and find resources, where they can get support, um, in order to do all of the things that they need to do to build all of those exciting features on your platform. So this used to be that place that developers would go to find information. Um, before we really came to this inflection point around the idea of open SaaS, we were really more focused on getting the ecosystem to build apps and themes for our marketplaces. Um, and I think that you can really see that reflected on the homepage here, but in kind of a misguided way. So we have these two CTAs at the top of the, uh, the homepage. Um, see what kinds of apps that you can build, or see what kinds of themes that you can build. Um, but when you clicked on those links, they would actually take you off of the documentation to the app or the theme marketplace. Um, so if I'm the developer and I'm visiting this homepage, I probably want to do one of three things. I want to um, understand quickly like, what this API is and how it works. I want to know the first steps that I need to take to start building an app. 
Um, or I want to know what I need to do to customize a theme. But I probably don't want to actually go and take a look at the app marketplace. So we definitely had some work to do there around considering user journeys and how developers were actually going to use this space. But kind of beyond that, our old developer portal was um, kind of implicitly communicating some not so great things. Um, so by taking you over to the app marketplace, in a way what we're saying is um, we want you to build something that starts benefiting us quickly, um, but we care less about actually helping you build that thing. Um, but beyond that, this space just kind of felt tired. Um, it felt like an afterthought. Um, and it felt like developers weren't really being considered first-class users of the platform. So this is where we are today um, after our redesign. It feels fresh, feels more fun. Um, but really beyond that, we really considered what developers were trying to accomplish and the paths that users take to find information. So we pulled out links to common use cases, uh, frequently used references, in order to make them more discoverable. Um, under the hood, we also completely re-platformed all of our API and theme documentation. Um, we consolidated everything onto one domain, which it actually was not before. Um, and we re re reworked the menu structure. So there was kind of an element of housekeeping to this project. Um, but it really was an opportunity to um, rework the portal in a way that felt very intentional and actually considered the way that developers were going to use this. So when you begin this kind of renovation project, um, it can feel kind of overwhelming. Um, there are so many things that we wanted to do, um, honestly, that we still want to do, that knowing where to begin is really not easy. Um, so you have to ask yourself, how does the developer portal fit into your company's kind of overall strategy? Um, documentation is going to be an important part of it, certainly, because if you don't have documentation, nobody can figure out how to use your product, and that is not good. Um, but a developer portal is more than just a place to stick your documentation. That's going to be a big part of it, but there are a lot of other reasons that developers come to this space. Um, so they might be looking to connect with other developers. Um, they might be needing to manage their business relationship with you. Um, and beyond that, they might just be forming a first impression about how your company thinks about developer experience. So we're still kind of talking about planning here. Um, but we're already going to bring metrics into that <laughs> equation. So this framework might look familiar to some of you. Um, this was popularized by Phil Legetter in the DevRel world. And it's become a really popular way of describing the uh, user journey and all of the supporting activities that uh, developers go through as they use your product. Um, so that is sorry, awareness, <laughs> activation, um, acquisition, retention, referral, uh, revenue and product. So awareness is making sure that developers actually know that your product exists. Um, acquisition is going to look different kind of depending on how your product is structured, but it might be something like an account sign up. Um, activation is getting developers to actually do the thing, so that might be making the first API call. Uh, Retention is using your product in production, actually maintaining that integration. Uh, revenue, that one kind of speaks for itself. Um, referral is activating developers to recommend your product to other developers. Um, and then product is this idea where the whole thing kind of comes full circle, and either through uh, direct contributions or their feedback, developers are contributing back to your product itself. So there are going to be parts of your portal that can kind of tie in to every stage of that framework, but it's really important to narrow your focus a little bit um, to make sure that you're aligning your efforts with what your company's priorities are. Um, so revenue is probably going to be a priority for your company um, and maybe even your developer relations program. Um, but that should be an implicit goal, not an explicit one. So even though you could tie your developer portal to revenue in kind of a long tail kind of way, um, your developer portal is probably not going to be a revenue generating machine, and that is okay. 
Similarly, product contribution is another really nice goal to have. But depending on the maturity of your program and where your developer portal is now, um, that might not be the goal that you want to focus on right now. So there are always going to be more things that you want to do than you're able to do at the time, but you have to narrow your focus and pick a path in order to move forward. Um, but either way, you want to start thinking about which segments of that developer <coughs> journey that you're going to focus on first, um, because that's going to influence how you measure your success down the line so that you know if your tactics are actually effective or not. Um, so for example, if you decide that you're going to be focused on awareness and acquisition, um, you're going to be thinking about things like account signups, page views, um, and you're going to need a way to measure those things in your developer portal. One of the ways that you know which areas that you should be focusing on in your portal is by talking to other internal stakeholders. Um, so there are going to be a lot of teams within your company that have an interest in your developer portal outside of just your developer relations and documentation teams. Um, so one example is uh, uh, partner managers. So these are the folks who are managing the business relationship with your developer ecosystem. And that looks really different company to company. Um, for us, partners are web development agencies and app partners who have a business relationship with us. Um, and then we also have the product team. So naturally the product team is going to want to make sure that the APIs that they've worked so hard to build are actually being documented and presented in a way that makes them usable. Um, but I think that's something that we forget sometimes is that the product team is really hungry for feedback. So they might be looking to your developer portal to um, get feedback about their products um, and also to source beta participants. <coughs> Um, and then the leadership team. So depending on how uh, developer experience is kind of baked into your company culture, um, your leadership team, uh, the developer portal may or may, may not be on their radar. Um, but you do need to be able to draw a line between what you're working on and then kind of the high level strategy that's coming down from leadership. So at this point we've talked a lot about what your company wants out of a developer portal. Um, but what about your actual developers? So in the beginning, we did a lot of user feedback interviews with members of our developer community to discover what the pain points are. Um, and some of the things that we heard were kind of already on our radar, um, like the need for a client library in a particular language, um, or more code samples. But some of what we heard um, was really insightful in that they were little things that helped you really see the portal through the user's eyes. Um, so one example of that, we had a request to put all of our code samples on a dark background because that is consistent with the IDEs that a lot of developers use, um, which makes total sense. It was a really simple thing to put into place that actually does have a big impact on user experience. Um, but before we got too far into this project, we wanted to make sure that we understood our developer community in kind of a more comprehensive way. So we spent a few months doing research and putting together developer personas. Um, it was really important to me that these personas be rooted in data. Um, so we did do a lot of the research for this in-house. We did not hire a third party to do a study for us. Um, so because of that, I might be a little bit biased. But I definitely believe that persona research is something that you can do in-house and still get a result that you can base decisions off of. So it doesn't necessarily need to be this big budget project. Although if you have the budget to get the study done, by all means, go for it. Um, so the way that we did this was by distributing a survey to the widest range of developers building on big commerce that we could. Um, and when we crafted this survey, we really wanted to generalize the questions a little bit to really get at what developers um, were interested in, how they worked, who they are, kind of more so than how they necessarily felt about our product specifically. Um, so we distributed the survey to all of our registered partners. We sent it out um, through the, de uh, the developer portal. Um, and also uh, on social media. So all in all, we really did get back a pretty good response that we could base our personas off of. So I'm not a data analyst, <laughs> but 
but you can still pull out some really interesting insights uh, from your data just using pivot tables and, uh, and filtering the data. So what you're looking for are answers that predict other answers. So if a developer tells you that they're self-taught, um, are they more likely to be working in a particular programming language? Or um, is a developer who's been programming for five years more likely to be interested in machine learning than somebody who's been programming for 20, or vice versa? So once you start kind of finding those commonalities, um, you can start forming groupings that are based on shared pain points, motivations, behaviors, interests, um, and all of those things are going to be more relevant to your personas than things like demographic details, something like age, location, or gender. And when you're putting these together, um, you do want to add some biographic detail also. Um, this adds depth to the persona and makes them feel real to all of the teams that are using this as a tool. Um, but you also want to be careful, right? Because if you start getting too imaginative with your personas, it starts to feel more like a creative writing exercise and people stop taking it seriously. Um, the other thing is that you do want to validate this both internally and externally. So externally, after we uh, got our survey results in and kind of did some preliminary work around personas, um, we set up a second round of phone interviews that were more conversational, more open-ended, um, to just kind of check the assumptions that we had made so far. Um, and really get a feel for who our developer community is. And then internally, um, we did a round of kind of shopping these personas around to all of the teams that work closely with the developer community. Um, and what we wanted to know was, does this feel true? You know, does this feel like a developer that you actually know and work with? Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about all of the key areas that kind of make up the developer portal. So when a developer comes to this space, they're probably trying to do one of four things. They're looking for documentation, they're looking for support, um, they're looking to connect with the wider community, um, or they want to do some kind of administrative task that's related to their business relationship with you. So your portal should be catering to users that are at all the different stages of the user journey. Um, so a developer who's just been activated, for example, they're going to need documentation, they're going to need community. Um, hopefully they don't need support just yet, um, but that should be available when they do get to that point. Um, and then if you're supporting both technical and non-technical users of your product, um, which is the case for us, you're going to need to have some way in your access and authentication model to mark developers as developers in your support process. And then lastly, um, if developers have entered into some kind of business relationship with you, for example, by becoming a partner, um, they're going to be looking to this space as well to manage things like commissions or their app listing. So that's a ton of functionality that's wrapped up into one single space. Um, what we are thinking about is ways that we can uh, provide pathing within the documentation portal um, so that developers can very intuitively figure out where they need to go. So one thing that we want to do in the future um, is more with permissions. So recognizing that um, there are a lot of different roles within a given organization that might be needing to log into this space. Um, so, for example, within a web development agency, you might have both technical users who need access as well as business roles. So you should have a way of differentiating between the two of those. Um, and also we're thinking a lot about pathing. So how do you provide cues that let developers know what's relevant? Um, for beginners, you're going to need to provide exploration materials, uh, things that are interactive and very quickly allow a developer to understand what is this? What does it do? Why is it exciting? And then for experienced developers with your product, you're going to need to provide reference materials. So links to references for quick lookups of information. So we think about this as a journey, right? And even now, we're not 100% of the way where we want to be with this. Um, but we think about it in terms of a maturity model where at level one, you have this experience that's very fragmented and incomplete. 
Um, and then level four is providing a unified portal experience that um, includes some level of pathing and personalization. So at level one, your portal might not even be uh, adequate for a developer to actually complete an API call. Um, it's gonna be largely a closed system. Um, maybe the uh, users have to email for support. Um, at level two, we're introducing some amount of self-service functionality. So when we say self-service, we mean that developers can gain access to things like support or community or uh, spin up a, a sandbox environment without actually having to contact you. And then at level three, we're including many of the hallmarks that make a successful developer portal. So we've got documentation in multiple programming languages, uh, code samples, and an active community around the product. And then at level four, you're doing all of those things, plus you have a certain level of personalization. So when you log into the portal, we're able to identify who you are and then show you an experience that's appropriate to your role. Um, so in terms of benchmarking, this is where we are right now. Um, and in the next year, we're gonna be completing a phase two of our developer portal redesign. So we hope to check the rest of those boxes for level four as well. But how do you know where your program lies along that maturity model? So one way that we do this is by creating a blended scorecard that assesses how the program is meeting needs across different areas. Um, so we score ourselves a matrix, uh, on a matrix across four categories. Um, so we've got openness and accessibility, um, environment and docs, API quality and ease of use, and then community and support. So this gives you an idea kind of of where things stand um, on an average across the entire program, um, and also individually for each category. So there might be some areas where you're actually doing really well, and then other areas um, maybe not so well. So this kind of gives you an idea of where you need to focus and where you need to put your energy next. All right, metrics are kind of a, a hot topic in developer relations. Um, sadly, there is no easy answer when it comes to uh, metrics and KPIs in your developer portal. And the reason for that is that there's so much functionality that's wrapped up inside the single space. You have community support, partner support, documentation, um, and all of those are actually going to have their own KPIs. Um, so there's not going to be a single metric that tells you the health of your developer portal. But it's important to understand what your goals are um, in order to understand which user behaviors support those goals. So if you are measuring page views, for example, um, which goal does that support? Or if your goal is activation, um, what user behaviors are indicating that developers are making their first API call? Um, and even more importantly, which of those can you actually measure? So in terms of measuring change, you also need to establish a baseline for comparison. Um, but if you're dealing with no data or bad data, it's really not, uh, not worth using that as a point of reference. So you need to build up enough reliable data about your users um, so that you can actually begin using that as a point of comparison. Um, and that kind of means deciding where this journey actually starts. Don't be discouraged if you start putting changes into place and you don't see change right away. Um, the truth is that we're talking about changing user behavior and that really does take time. Um, so none of the benchmarks in the maturity model are going to be immediate gratification for your program. Um, honestly, in our case, the only time that we've really seen a big jump in our numbers was when we introduced single sign-on for our community. So not too surprisingly, if you make it dramatically easier to actually log in and access the space, you are gonna see a lot more engagement there. Um, but that's unusual. In most cases, um, you'll put something into place and then change is usually a much more long-term process. You also need to have the support of all of your internal stakeholders um, in order to move the needle. So if your partner account managers aren't directing developers to the resources that you've created, or if product or leadership are not on board with this idea of developer experience, then you're going to have a really hard time actually seeing change. 
Redefining a developer portal um, is a big investment in time and resources. But your developer portal is also the single biggest interface that you have with your community. Um, so you want to make sure that you align your goals with your company's strategy across all of the internal stakeholders who have an interest in developer activities. Um, and you also want to know your users because that is going to determine what you build. Um, understanding who your developers are and what they're trying to accomplish and how they work is going to allow you to provide the best experience for the majority of your users. And then you also need to benchmark against a maturity model that makes sense for your product and your company and your ecosystem um, because there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution here. Um, the answer is not to just do what Twilio or Stripe did, although there's definitely an opportunity to learn from companies that do this really well. Um, but it's not going to be an overnight process. Um, if you commit to a path, you will start to create a developer portal that your company will be really proud of, and your developers will actually be delighted to use. Do we have time for questions? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, I really uh, like the email about the and creating your personas. Mm -hmm. It's a hot topic for us as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. a lot more than uh, a while back. But what I wanted to ask is what changes did you see or what are the sort of like just a couple important things that you that you reacted to or changed mm -hmm. in your portal or your activities mm -hmm. that you didn't before after you created the personas and the segments? Like if you have something off the top of your head. Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind is um, so probably this shouldn't be too surprising, but one of the teams that was most excited about personas was product design. <laughs> I mean, people who are already kind of used to using this as a tool. Um, but the thing is that thinking about developer user journeys had not been a huge part of our product design process in the past. Um, so once we had these personas that we could kind of look to, um, that became another persona that we really were sort of like formally thinking about in the product design process. Th things tend to end up, um, you know, you have some stuff on GitHub, mm -hmm. and you have some stuff in a wiki, and how, what do you, have you had any significant lessons of how to tie these things together in a user-friendly way? Yeah, so you are not wrong. <laughs> uh, there definitely exists, like, that kind of, like, patchwork of, like, different systems. Um, so in our case, it's uh, GitHub and Salesforce and Stoplight and kind of like all of these different technologies that we're weaving together. Um, we have had definitely some success with using Stoplight and Salesforce to integrate, and it's something that we work kind of closely with our internal Salesforce developers. Um, but that's kind of allowed us to like embed experiences within a single interface. So even though it is this patchwork of technologies, it seems very seamless. We, we call those Franken sites. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, sure. um, I'm curious about um, Stack Overflow. Mm -hmm. um, it, we, you know, a lot of developers go there first for questions, and you talk about metrics around community and support on your portal. Have you looked at measuring things on Stack Overflow, or do you think about that as the community? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, we definitely consider that to be part of our community. Um, it's a little bit harder to measure. Um, it's something that we've really, like, just in the last couple of months, started building a process to um, kind of track SLAs and like what questions we're getting and how quickly they're being answered in Stack Overflow. Um, so there is, I forget the name, it's Stack Overflow Data Exchange, I think, or something like that, where you can actually build queries um, around certain tags in Stack Overflow. So we do that and pull data in and try to make it look meaningful to us. <laughs> but it's something that's kind of on our radar right now. I think that's it for, for questions. I'd like to say another